Now, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and you're all very welcome here to the Institute. My name is Nora Owen, and I chair the Justice Committee here in the Institute. And uh, we're very, very honoured to have a speaker here today who, at some stages when he worked here with the Institute and did papers and that, probably found himself sitting down there where Barry is sitting, you know, and he did make a comment to me that he didn't usually get into the photos downstairs. Well, our, our guest today is somebody who has um, really made us proud as an Irishman in what he is now doing. And um, before we actually start, could I ask you to turn your phones off or certainly onto silent and to explain that the presentation is, is for public consumption and the questions and answers afterwards are in the, what they call the Chatham House or Europe House rules. So you can use the information, but you don't assign it to anybody in particular. And um, so, so we, will, we will hear from Eugene. So Eugene Regan, many of you will know Eugene from, um, you know there's a thing in the, in the Simpsons, you know, you probably remember me from this famous movie, those of you who watched The Simpsons, I think it was a man called Doug McClure or something. And, um, but Eugene is now um, really, um, I suppose the most senior judge that we have serving in the UK and um, uh, sorry, the European Union. My <laughs> we were talking downstairs at lunch. <laughs> sorry about that. He, he'd now be nearly out of a job, you know. And, and um, he's going to talk to us today about, um, you know, what, what is happening. Uh, he's president of the fifth chamber of the Court of Justice of the European Union. And he's going to discuss with us the changes that may arise in the Court of Justice post Brexit, as well as the rule of law and the preservation of EU values. Um, another big issue that is on people's minds with the changes that are happening is the whole issue of extradition and the European arrest warrant. Now, none of you, I hope, will ever have to worry about the European arrest warrant uh, anywhere you travel, but it is a big issue, and we have people today, I'm very pleased to say, from, from all elements of our law in, in the country, between the Chief Justice and the DPP and somebody from the AG's office, and these are issues that are currently being very well studied, as you know, by everybody, just to see where we're going now with the, with the Brexit agreement. So um, I, I was working here with Eugene in the Committee uh, of Justice, and uh, he, I don't think he ever thought he would be a judge in the, in the European Court, but he has uh, been elected now as the president, and there are four, Eugene will explain, I think there are four, five, s five senior Irish people now in, in, the, uh, in the various systems in the European court and, uh, in courts, and it's, it's a, a tribute to those of you who are in the academic world, who have maybe taught some of these people, those of you who are practicing law here, to see how our lawyers can take their place among the best in the world. And of course, on another element, it's very important that there are Irish people in these positions because, as you know, we are one of three common law jurisdictions left now, Malta and Cyprus and Ireland, Ireland being the biggest one left now. So it's important to have Irish people there. So we're looking forward to hearing what Eugene has to say, and then you can store up your questions at the end. So Eugene, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Nora. Uh, I enjoyed <coughs> my time at the Institute here, and <coughs> Nora was a superb chairperson of the Justice Group. I think we did a lot of very good work and really appreciated working with her. Um, I also, with Jill Donahue, who uh, was a director of operations at all times, and I have to say, while I came to the Institute with a certain knowledge of the law, it was fine-tuned here in many respects in the Institute uh, as we went through the different treaty changes from the, the Nice Treaty, Lisbon Treaty, and all these treaties where you uh, examine every change in minute detail. And uh, <clears throat> if I wasn't an expert in European law before I came here, I, I felt I was uh, in leaving the Institute. I was also delighted to see Barry Andrews here. Uh, Barry Andrews is a gentleman uh, he was a gentleman in the cut and thrust of politics out in Dunleary when I was competing against him, and I'm delighted to see him in the position and his involvement here in the Institute. Um, the challenges facing Europe 
they just change in nature. Because, but it, there have always been extraordinary challenges. I mean, the union itself was a response to uh, the, the uh, Second World War. Uh, the, the enlargement was a response to the need for democratization in Europe, and particularly in Eastern Europe. The single market was a response to the need for a strong European internal market to compete against uh, other markets at that time, the United States of America. And the development of union citizenship and fundamental rights also responded to concerns, uh, both political and legal, uh, about the d democratic and legal legitimacy of the union. And today we're faced with other problems. Financial and economic uh, crisis was one of them. Um, the war on our borders, which leads to the uh, refugee crisis and, and increased migration flows. Uh, and there's the issue of state and commercial surveillance and uh, the uh, perennial legitimacy issues within the union itself, including the respect for free movement. And the fact that so many of these issues can only be resolved at a European level and in many cases at a, a global level, it does mean that these problems uh, can only be resolved at that level. And 28 member states representing 7% of the world's population have pooled their sovereignty um, and in an endeavour to resolve these type of issues, um, whether it's from fishing to air tra traffic control, uh, privacy, uh, data privacy, and are the European Space Agency. That is the commitment. They have also committed to the binding ju jurisdiction uh, of a legal system and the <coughs> European Court, um, shortly to be 27, it would appear. Therefore, many of the challenges facing today's society are ultimately ones which find their way to the European Court. Uh, and we see that court as a, a court which is in partnership with national courts. It is part of one system, uh, and it is the national courts which are on the, the front line in terms of raising the problems, raising the issues, which our court have to uh, find a, an interpretation and a suggested solution which facilitates uh, the uh, application of European law at national level. Um, I'd just like to say a few words about the structure, the role and, and structure of the court. Um, I will touch on the, uh, the UK withdrawal issue, but there's very little I can say on that. But I will refer then to a number of very specific issues which I think are very important in Europe, important for Ireland. Uh, and I think just as the courts cooperate with the European Court in the type of questions they refer, which enables us to resolve uh, certain key issues. Uh, I think it applies more generally in that you know, Ireland can play this role in terms of not only trying to solve our own problems, but by thinking and working at a European level, we can assist in solving some of the European problems and thereby solve our own because they are in fact the same problems. With regard to, um, I think the Chief Justice was speaking, Frank Lark here, earlier in the week and mentioned this issue about apex courts. And essentially the European Court, it's a court of interpretation. It's not a Supreme Court in terms of uh, uh, appealing to Europe from national courts. It's a question of interpretation. Questions are referred uh, to us from national courts and we work with national courts in providing an interpretation which assists them in resolving their case, only when it comes to an interpretation of European law. The court has six main functions. Um, uh, now, some of the lawyers in the room would, would know this, but perhaps uh, I can remind them. It's first a court of final appeal, not from the national courts, from the lower court in Luxembourg, the general court. And we have two Irish members on that court, uh, Tony Collins and a former high court judge, um, Colin McCockey. So, for example, the, the Apple case goes to the general court uh, and uh, it will most likely, possibly, maybe come to us on appeal. Um, so it, we then deal with requests, as I said, from national courts and tribunals in terms of interpretation um, where there is a, a 
the point of an EU directive or a treaty article which has not been interpreted, the position is not quite clear on the interpretation, then the courts here will refer a question to us, and I'll give some examples of that. Then you have um, infringements where member states uh, do not comply with directives, do not comply with uh, regulations, uh, are in some way infringe EU rules, uh, then we, there are infringement proceedings and also uh, penalty proceedings so that uh, member states can be penalised, uh, as Ireland has in certain environmental matters, uh, can be penalised periodically as well as a lump sum penalty. And there's no problem about collecting these penalties because they're deducted from member states' budgets. So it's a very effective weapon uh, it, to ensure the rule of law uh, or the uh, compliance with the law. The fourth element of the, the court's work is to resolve inter-institutional disputes between um, the institutions. It also, um, it's not down as one of its functions, but there is a jurisprudence that where there's a dispute between member states, they're obliged to bring that case uh, to before the European Court. Uh, we have, at the moment, I think, uh, there's a land dispute between Slovenia and uh, Croatia. That type of case uh, is brought to the court. We, the fifth is we issue opinions. In other words, the European Commission requested an opinion of the court as to the compliance with EU law of the Singapore trade agreement. We have the same with Canadian agreement. And uh, in the past, we had the, uh, an, a, gave an opinion on the accession of the European Union uh, to the uh, Court of Human Rights, Convention of Human Rights. Um, the sixth ro uh, role is the declaration of persons entering upon a high office. Uh, so commissioners or judges or uh, 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 positions of, of such high office in the European institutions, the court would, uh, there is a, a hearing and they the, uh, the, uh, make an oath, their oath of office uh, before us. Um, as to the functioning of the court, um, in a way the court has been well served in the past and, and just to remind you of the, the people who have held the position I hold today, um, Cahar O'Dawley, um, President of the High Court, Andreas O'Keefe at the time, former Chief Justice Tom O'Higgins, then former Attorney General John Murray, uh, uh, former uh, uh, High Court Judges Fidelma Mackin and Andreas O'Keefe. Uh, so I'm very proud to serve in, in that tradition. Then we had uh, Niall Fennelly as Advocate General. So in the court you have 28 judges, one from each member state, and you have 11 Advocate Generals who give an opinion on cases before they would come to us. It's a, very much a French system in that, in that regard. But we had Niall Fennelly, in 19, uh, a, was appointed in 1995, I think is the year, and uh, he served with distinction uh, for six years uh, um, and gave some very seminal opinions which influenced ultimately the court in, a, in its judgments. And this year uh, we have uh, Gerard Hogan, who is a uh, former judge of the Court of Appeal, and he has joined us from the, uh, the uh, uh, 7th of October, or 8th of October, uh, and will be with us for uh, six years. The next time Ireland will have the Advocate General position is likely to be in the 30s, 2030. So it's by rotation. The larger member states have a permanent um, uh, Advocate we General. Room, yes, <laughs> exactly, yeah. Now, the court elects its own president and vice president and the president of chambers. And um, I, I was saying earlier that I thought I had left politics, and I have, but um, I, I was t appointed tallyman for the voting of, of the, the new, uh, the new uh, president, vice president, and uh, head of chambers when I, when I came to the court three years ago. Uh, but in fact, um, uh, I was elected myself. I, I served as president of uh, a, committee, a chamber of, th of three, which is the sixth chamber uh, in the second year in, in, uh, in, in Luxembourg. But uh, the, it is the fifth, the, the chamber of five, where uh, there, there is an election, and I was elected to that position, president of chamber. 
And the way that works is the court is split into five chambers of five. Uh, and um, when a case is allocated by the president to any judge in that chamber of five, it will be heard in the, the chamber that I'm president of. And also each chamber is sovereign in that it, it is up to us how to decide that case. And there is no interference from president, vice president, or any other judge in the court. It is that chamber that decides that case and has full authority to come to a decision in that case. Um, one thing about the court is that we have no ability to refuse cases. There's no filter, uh, filtering system. Uh, we must deal with every case, uh, from VAT to environment, uh, the rule of law, the, the Brexit, whatever the cases are, we, we have to hear them. And um, the, um, we dealt in 2017, just to give you the flavor of it, uh, 700, around 750 cases. Um, and 72% of these were preliminary questions from national courts throughout the union, and about 20% were appeals from the general court, the equivalent of the high court here in, in, uh, in Luxembourg. Now, we take about 16 months to, to uh, give an answer to a question from a national court, which seems like an eternity, but in fact, if you allow for translation uh, of, of documents into 24 official languages, uh, you can appreciate that the translation burden uh, uh, accounts for a very significant amount of the time. And the, just to exp it's, you know, we try to balance uh, dealing with the case um, efficiently, but also fairly, and uh, allowing enough time to, and due consideration for the case. Um, but the way it works, very simply, if I am appointed judge rapporteur, uh, after all the written procedure with all the interventions of the parties, and I should say, when there is a question referred from a national court, all governments, all member states have an opportunity to make an intervention. So all of that is taken into account when we have a hearing and, uh, uh, in, and, and in deciding on the case. But if a case is referred to me, and uh, I would do a preliminary report for the weekly meeting of the court, and I would recommend, given the importance of the case, that it should be dealt with in a grand chamber, which is a chamber of 15. That's when it's a unique issue, has quite wide implications, new area of law. And um, uh, if it's a very um, straightforward case, which the law is well settled, there might be just some technical issues to look at, would recommend a chamber of three. Uh, and then you might have a case like the Pringle case, uh, which had to do with the stability mechanism. Um, that was a the full 28 judges. And we have a case tomorrow, uh, which is a case from the Scottish courts in relation to Brexit. And that will be a plenary hearing, also of 28. Um, the last case. Uh, where it was a full court was Pringle. The one before that was uh, Commission versus Madame Cresson. And if you remember at the time of the dismissal of the, the commission, uh, she was a commissioner uh, at the time. Um, so it's um, the, the, uh, the other issue, while we have uh, the average is around 16 months, uh, we do have a, a system of expedited procedure and urgent procedure. And I'll, I'll give some examples of Irish cases that have come to us where we have dealt with them by expedited and urgent procedures, and we can generally deal with a case within three or four months. Um, but it is better if there is time to, for proper consideration of, of the cases. Uh, it, it can uh, uh, lead to problems if the matter is rushed. Um, so, as I say, if I am um, uh, Judge Rapporteur, present a report very briefly, uh, then within literally five weeks we have a hearing. Uh, and uh, after that you have a certain number of weeks for the Advocate General to give an opinion. And it's like clockwork. Uh, the, if the Advocate General gives a particular opinion on a particular date, I would indicate literally within a week whether I'm going to follow the broad lines of the Advocate General or not. Uh, if not, or if yes, another judge might say, well, I think we should have a or a discussion about this, and we uh, there might be a meeting 
uh, to uh, agree the general orientation on the case, and then you write up the judgment accordingly. If nobody objects to the approach you're taking, you proceed to draft the judgment, and uh, it, uh, it goes for deliberation or for consultation. But again, I would draft a case, uh, a, a judgment, and the judges in my uh, chamber, uh, or if it's a grand chamber case, there's literally 10 days for them to produce a note if they have some suggestions to make or objections to make to some of the drafting. And um, uh, then I would have literally a, a number of days to incorporate what I consider appropriate of those suggestions for a, a, an amended judgment, and then we have a oral uh, discussion about the case. But it is a very efficient system, even though it seems like a long time for a case to get back to the, uh, to, to the national courts. We have about 100 grand chamber cases, um, and that is a case dealt with by 15 judges. And that is the, around the equivalent of the number of cases, I believe, that the US Supreme Court would deal with. Uh, and uh, now they would have a f filtering system of cases. But in a sense, uh, we compare those cases to the type of cases that uh, the uh, United States Supreme Court would deal with. Um, the one issue about uh, the, how we deal with cases, the, um, the hearings, um, we do actually have hearings for the vast majority of cases. But it's not, it's very much uh, um, a feature of our common law system, not so much the civil law system. There are many Supreme Courts and Constitution Courts that never have a hearing or very seldom. Uh, and if they are, they're very perfunctory. Um, but um, you have to reason and, and justify why you want a hearing. In other words, to clarify specific questions. Um, but again, if the question that's referred from the National Court if the context, factual context, is explained uh, uh, clearly and the legal position nationally is explained, we don't interpret national law, we interpret European law, but it is necessary to have the context. And um, if, in fact, on the day of a hearing there is a dispute about some factual matters, uh, our interlocutor is the national court and we go on what they tell us, and it, it does create a problem if there are other parties now saying, well, actually, that's not the, how the national legislation operates, or that's not the factual situation in the case. Um, however, the other aspect is, uh, unlike the Supreme Court here, there's no dissenting judgments. There's no, uh, we might dissent, but we don't uh, publish those dissents. And perhaps it's, it's also, uh, ensures that there's you know, an effort made to encompass all positions, but uh, there's no question that uh, our cases are not decided by unanimity, and um, there, there will always be a certain uh, tension in terms of how a case should be uh, either concluded or reasoned. And I should say that the vast majority of uh, judgments in whatever chamber they're dealt with the end result, there is in fact a, um, a broad consensus. And a lot of our discussion is how we reason it, how we explain it, because I think that's uh, what's very important for, for lawyers and national authorities in implementing and uh, courts in, in uh, uh, following through on the interpretation that, that we give. Um, I would say, given the way the court operates, La French is the language of the court. All our discussions are in French. All our judgments are produced in French. Uh, any notes that are um, uh, uh, produced in relation to judgments are in French. So uh, it, is, it is very important that, um, you know, when we think of the common law system, that, that we have lawyers who uh, can master that language um, it's not necessary for the court for when they're presenting a case in the court because we have interpretation for all official languages, uh, which I think is a, is a very good thing. But in terms of increasing numbers of Irish lawyers who might work in the court, and there is a crying need for more Irish lawyers and common law lawyers, um, the, the, the language is, is an imperative. 
it's not written in stone that we operate through French. It, it is actually um, a decision that was made, presumably from the time of the six, uh, and it has is the last of the institutions, the European institutions, that actually uh, have retained French as their, their main language. Um, but I don't see it ending tomorrow. There, it, is, uh, it is well embedded, and I think it gives a flavor to the way that European judgments and European law uh, manifests itself. Um, just say a word about Ireland and the courts. I mean, our system is based on a constitutional system. It's based on the rule of law, respect for fundamental rights. The, uh, the, the EU also is a constitution. It is based on guarantees of independent judiciary, protects the citizens against uh, arbitrary exercise of power. Uh, and the Irish state is also founded on uh, respect for international law ref reflected in Article 29, so that there, there is a great similarity in some respects. And it does explain also by virtue of the fact that we have successive referendums which have uh, changed our fixed constitution uh, in accordance with uh, popular uh, view and opinion that there has been no element of uh, difficulty in adjusting to uh, the European legal system or indeed a willingness to incorporate uh, EU law and to test EU law, Irish law against EU law. And I have to say that Ireland features very much in Europe at the moment, mainly because of the Irish question or the Irish problem. And I keep trying to explain, it's not exactly an Irish problem, it's <laughs> just a little bit further out. But it also uh, features in another uh, uh, respect, and that is the references that, are, that come from the Irish courts. Uh, are quite uh, extraordinary. It's, they're, they're excellently flame, uh, framed, they're relevant, uh, and uh, uh, I think uh, very, very pertinent to all this what's happening in, in Europe. In, in the area of extradition, we have had Lanigan, Selmer, uh, O'Connor cases, um, and uh, the, um, what, one of them now which has been renamed Oro, um, but in the extradition area, you have Cousins and Donnellan in the area of taxation. Um, you have uh, Farrell and Whitty and Smith and Mead in the area of horizontal direct effect and the issue of direct effect. And then you have Pringle in the area of monetary policy. And of course, the Digital Rights Ireland, uh, in which I, in fact, appear for the Irish state in, and Schrems uh, in the field of personal data. So the, the Irish references have been right on point, uh, cutting at the heart of some of the uh, European, um, important European policies, and, and they have made uh, new law. So I think it is that co cooperation between our court and the national courts which is of fundamental importance and it is amazing that Ireland has been able to make such a contribution. I think since our entry we had 115 references. Uh, the United Kingdom had 633, France had 1,000. So I think uh, at different times we have uh, uh, not had so many references, but overall, I think it's a it's a, a, a large figure, and it's rising. I think last year we had uh, more references than the United Kingdom, um, uh, which uh, which I think is is not just because the United Kingdom have dropped, but it's because the Irish courts have been somewhat more active in referring cases. The way it works with references is that the uh, any court can refer a case, a recognized court can refer a case uh, for clarification to our court. The Supreme Court must make a reference if it's not clear, uh, the, 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 the interpretation. Uh, there is an obligation there, and uh, um, I, I think uh, the system, system has worked very, very well. The other thing is that I think it is generally recognized, apart from the references, the quality of lawyers who uh, the state appoint and companies appoint to represent uh, them in, in, in our court, uh, all of the other judges remark on the quality of the lawyers who come out. Because I don't know whether it's the tradition, 
but uh, in terms of fielding questions, responding to questions, uh, being a bit more flexible in their presentation and, and more. Uh, whereas other, other countries seem to have follow a very set script uh, where uh, something is simply read out and when they're asked a question, tend to, in many cases, uh, fall apart. Now, that's not in all cases. But the Irish, the advocacy from the Irish barristers, uh, and it's not I saying it, it has been said to me before by, by other judges. The UK, and I have to say the UK uh, bar uh, has been, is, is uh, excellent. And it does influence uh, cases, the outcome of cases where the Irish state would intervene uh, there's a, uh, an informed presentation of a case. Uh, it has a, it has a uh, can have a profound effect. Then, just to speak about a, a number of issues. I mean, Brexit is the one issue that is of um, the the political issue of the day, and it comes to our door. Uh, well, in, in in two respects. First, an excellent reference from Ireland, both from the High Court and the Supreme Court. Now, in fairness, the Supreme Court was first in making the reference. Um, and it, it did concern, does concern and did concern uh, the effect of Brexit. Uh, individuals who, uh, if they are extradited to the United Kingdom, the question arises, well, what about their fundamental rights in the light of Brexit, which will not be subject to the, the same system? They would not be able to, if an issue arises on their imprisonment, uh, that they would uh, not be able to challenge something before the European Court. They... Um, might not get the full benefit of deduction of sentences, which is all provided for in EU law. And, and that is a, a case that came to, to my chamber, not as the previous chamber where I was a member of. And basically the response was, well, uh, let's take the law as it is. And also, even if you project into the future, uh, the United Kingdom is still a member of uh, uh, the European Convention of Human Rights. And the, there is a parallel between the protection of rights in the European Convention of Human Rights as there is in the European Charter, which is part of the treaty. Uh, and uh, there is no reason to believe that, uh, that, that um, the rights uh, guaranteed in that convention would not be respected by the UK courts and the UK authorities. Um, then we have the inner house of the Scottish Court of Session, Scotland's highest court, which have referred uh, a case to us concerning the withdrawal of Article uh, 50. And in fact, that's going to be dealt with, as I said, tomorrow uh, in Luxembourg, tomorrow morning, and it'll be the full 28 uh, judges of the court. It's a very straightforward question. Uh, can Britain uni unilaterally revoke the, the notice? Uh, now, we have to deal with first, is it a hypothetical question? Is it, uh, is it admissible? Uh, and then we have to deal with the substance of, of the case if, if deemed admissible. Uh, but um, it will be a full hearing. Um, it's impossible to say anything else about it in case I would <laughs> in any way, in any way, um, get myself in trouble. Um, so I, I think we can speculate as to what cases might come to our court in relation to Brexit, uh, but you know the very withdrawal agreement itself, whatever that withdrawal agreement will be, if if ratified, because as I said earlier, we have a, a member state or an institution can request an opinion from us as to whether uh, an agreement is 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 complies with EU law in its own right. So I think. One can anticipate issues of free movement, social security, fundamental rights, but uh, I can only speculate as to uh, those type of issues that may arise post-Brexit, except I think we do know uh, and can anticipate that uh, it's not going to be a um, smooth passage. Um, the, just uh, one other matter concerning um, Brexit is that the fact that the common law the, 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 uh, uh, will now be much reduced in terms of presence in, the, in Europe and in the court. Uh, personally, I don't uh, see a problem with that. Um, um, it was a system uh, given to us in Ireland when the, Nor when the Normans came. We have adjusted it and adopted it, I think, 
very well. But I think that there has been, uh, the common law has influenced European law in many, in many ways to date. And I think there is an appreciation, as I said earlier, of the common law tradition. Also, I think we, you know, our interpretation of, of law is, is not too dissimilar from our own system. I mean, you know, we look at the wording, we look at the um, context, we look at the intention of the legislator, we look at the objectives of the director of the system or of the, um, of the treaty provisions. We work on a comparative um, model of interpretation. You know, we have, there's a section within the, the court called research and documentation. And quite often before we um, have a hearing or a delivery on a case, uh, they do an exercise on checking what is the situation in all member states in relation to some aspect of the law. So, you know, it's not as if we, we operate in this, in this uh, civil, civil law context. And also, I, I think there is as many differences between the civil law tradition in different member states than there is between the common law and civ civil law. So I think it is, uh, you know, sometimes we, we get a little bit uh, uh, too concerned in, the, in this regard. There is also something that our systems, apart from the legal system, there are systems of government which are different. You know, the, the one thing that strikes me is, uh, you know, when, well, actually, I didn't have to register, but if you go as a, a non-diplomatic status person to Luxembourg or Belgium or Germany, you have to register in your local commune. Now, that is quite a significant uh, thing. You don't have to do that in England or Ireland, you know, this, this registration. Uh, and, and I think there are a lot of aspects of the way the system of government works, which, which means we have a, a, a very... Uh, uh, similar type of legal system as well as the United Kingdom, which, which it's not just the legal system, but different with the system of, of government. Um, if I can just move to the uh, issue of fundamental rights and the rule of law. Um, now, when we, when we joined uh, the European Union, even then fundamental rights was not a, a, an issue that there was certain reference to fundamental rights and to the common traditions of uh, constitutional traditions of member states, but fundamental rights uh, became more and more important to have that embedded and given treaty status, which was done with the Charter of Fundamental Rights. Uh, it is not as if the court was impervious to that issue, but more and more the very legitimacy of the Union uh, and the legitimacy of its decisions had to take account of fundamental rights and the German Constitutional Court had uh, a, a role to play in that regard. Now, again, this is an issue raised by a reference from Aileen Donnelly, Judge Aileen Donnelly of the, of the High Court here, uh, which uh, raised the issue the European Commission have produced a paper on foot of Article 7.1 of the treaty that there's a risk to the rule of law in Poland. And um, so she's asking, why should we, why, how can I safely uh, um, extradite uh, somebody to uh, Poland if there is a threat to the, an independent judiciary and um, to the whether this person would ha have an effective remedy and uh, uh, receive a fair trial. And that created consternation in, in Poland, and there was a lot of uh, public comment and indeed uh, unfair criticism of the Irish High Court judge for uh, raising that issue. I have to say no reference from any court has got so much attention as this reference from the High Court, because it did raise a very fundamental question about the rule of law an, an independent judiciary in, in, in Poland. And um, that was in a grand chamber case of 15. I was in the chamber. And, um, you know, we did uh, rule that it is only the council that under Article 7.2 that can uh, deem uh, a, a, a member state. Uh, there is provision in the European arrest warrant framework decision that it's only... Um, uh, in those circumstances where the Council um, find under Article 7.2 that uh, a member state is in breach, that you would not extradite. But in fairness, 
the High Court judge, in an excellent reference, outlined a procedure whereby uh, she could work with the decision of the court and do I test and ask more questions of the, the Polish courts. In the event, uh, following our judgment, uh, which advised to do just that, that it's the fact that there's a threat doesn't mean that the Polish judiciary is, is, is uh, um, an individual judges. I mean, to condemn the entire judiciary in those circumstances, uh, we felt was unjustified, so that it was to examine in a concrete case what is the position. Is it a political type offence? Is it a you know a ordinary criminal offence? Uh, and uh, in Donnelly did go back with further questions, and in a very comprehensive judgment, I think it runs to almost 40 pages, analysing in minute detail. Um, actually did extradite uh, the, the person in question. But I do think the message uh, was made uh, and, and sent out about the importance of the rule of law, and I think that judgment was, was just simply had profound effects. And in one way, uh, in terms of, of, of the ultimate result, uh, I, I think it, might, it, it shows that she acted in a completely balanced and, and uh, correct manner and followed through on the logic of her own decision in testing um, the, um, the, the danger that the person might not uh, get a fair trial. Um, the European arrest warrant is an issue, and we were speaking about it earlier, fundamental to the uh, investigation, prosecution and uh, uh, of crime in the European Union. And um, they're, 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 uh, we created an exception to extradition in, in a case called Calderado and Arignosi, where they, uh, if there is a risk of inhuman and degrading treatment in terms of prison conditions, there can be an exception to what normally was uh, strict rules set out in, in, a, in a framework decision. Um, I had a case where I was judge rapporteur in my chamber, and it was a German case concerning extradition to Hungary. Uh, and uh, the, uh, it was a case where I think the judge perhaps took it too far, and he had 78 questions for the Hungarian court uh, about what are the smoking conditions? Do the person, has the person uh, facilities to practice their religion? which is all very reasonable, but it went on in that, in that vein. It wasn't just the space in the prison, it was uh, everything and anything. Uh, so um, the, uh, the court found that perhaps been a little bit too, too anxious about <coughs> the, um, uh, so we reverted to the application of the, 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 uh, the regulation or the framework decision. Independence of judiciary, um, again, it's on the same theme, but there was a case uh, against Hungary some years ago which, where the uh, retirement age was reduced from 70 to 62 years for all judges. And um, that was a case actually that didn't, the, the rule of law issue wasn't really, uh, didn't feature in the case as such, but it was decided purely on discrimination grounds that this was uh, not, uh, was a breach of the quality directive. Um, then we had a case uh, this year concerning um, judges' pay in Portugal. And uh, this was a reduction. It has a certain residence, I know, in this country. Uh, and the, the judges, um, it was a reference about, now it was a reduction, salary reduction across the board. Ministers, everybody had the same reduction. And uh, the, but the court had the opportunity to to, to deal with the concept of independence. And, and I think it's worth just re reading just one short paragraph, if I may. It stated that the concept of independence presupposes, in particular, that the body concerned exercises its judicial functions wholly autonomously, without being subject to any hierarchical constraint or subordinated to any other body, and without orders or instructions from any source whatsoever, and that it is thus protected against external interventions or pressure liable to impair the independent judgment of its members and to influence their decisions. Um, and again, you know, I, I, I know we had our, the constitutional amendment in 2012, um, but um, in, in a sense, the, the 
the reductions here were, uh, uh, um, uh, it, it wasn't the focus of the, um, the judgment, but they were totally across the board um, in, in Portugal. The um, other case, which is, again, the most important case, I think, that uh, we are dealing with at the moment other than Brexit, and that is um, Commission versus Poland. And this, again, is about judges and the forced retirement of judges in the reduction, by means of the reduction of the retirement age. Now, I would just say on this, uh, in terms of the Article 7.1 procedure, which the Commission initiated, um, it was always said that this could not be progressed because Hungary was supporting Poland and it would never get past the, the, the post. But in fact, Article 7.1 about a risk of uh, threat to the, um, uh, the rule of law does not require unanimity. Uh, it required four-fifths majority in the council. But you would be surprised by the member states who did not support uh, that progressing, that 7-1 uh, procedure. It's the 7-2 that requires unanimity, where you find an actual finding, uh, not just a, a risk. Um, and again, that is something which has landed at our door. Now, the Commission worked with Poland for quite a number of years to try to resolve this, uh, but ultimately, and only very recently, uh, um, initiated infringement proceedings. Um, W the Vice President, uh, she has authority to deal with injunctive type uh, procedures, but she issued an injunction to Poland not to, pr uh, to uh, proceed with this and to suspend until uh, we dealt with the case. And it does appear that uh, Poland uh, have ultimately decided uh, to reverse the law in this area. And I think it perhaps does demonstrate the um, the importance of the court and the importance of, as a, as a guarantor of the rule of law, and, and the fact that it is very exceptional that a, that a, a ruling of the court is not respected. And in, in this very highly charged political atmosphere, it is uh, important to see that, that Poland has responded, and I think it's, it's to be welcomed. Um, very quickly, on uh, data protection and privacy, and. Now, this has become a very important issue. Of course, it features in the Charter of Fundamental Rights, the protection of personal data. But in the age of Cambridge Analytica, you know, it's not just the profiling of individuals, but it's also the, um, the, uh, and the right to privacy, invasion of privacy, but it's also the, the risk to democracy. And again, you know, one of the most important cases here was you know, well, first digital rights, and then Schrems was influenced by digital rights. Both were references from the Irish courts to the European court. Um, but we have at the moment cases like uh, Facebook Ireland, uh, which, uh, you know, concerns the um, co-responsibility of operators of Facebook fan pages. Uh, we have a case at the moment which concerns, uh, it's a lottery in Germany, and you have a, a, a select, you have to unselect if you if you don't agree to, to the data being used. But again, um, we're right in the thick of that with the digital rights and friend, SHREMS, and also, of course, that uh, a lot of the companies that have their headquarters here, which feature in these cases. Monetary and budgetary policy, I've mentioned Pringle. Uh, we had the Gauweiler case, which concerned the overwrite, over, overwrite monetary transaction scheme, I won't go into the details, but it had to do with, with bond buying, which the court, which was the first reference ever from the German Constitutional Court to our court. Uh, and it is a big issue in Germany, of course, that uh, um, the actions of the European Central Bank uh, respect strictly their mandate on monetary policy and don't encroach into, into uh, um, economic policy and, and finance. Uh, and be seen to finance uh, uh, member states' uh, uh, budgets. Uh, but we have that case which had been decided um, in favor of the decision. The, well, actually, uh, that case concerned a press release by the uh, European Central Bank. 
uh, as to what they were going to do in terms of uh, outright monetary transactions scheme. And um, we have another case at the moment which, con which concerns the um, um, public sector asset purchase program. Uh, and again, it's, it's VICE is the name of the case. Again, that will be announced on the, uh, in, in the 11th of December, I think. But again, it's, it's the same issue, and it shows the sensitivity of that issue in, in uh, Germany. One other case, Spain versus Council, and here's where one of the communities in Spain gave the wrong figures to the central government. The wrong figures were reported to the European uh, uh, Statistics Office, and um, ultimately they proposed a debt, a budgetary deficit in, in, in Spain was incorrectly reported and a financial penalty was imposed on Spain for that breach. So it, it just illustrates the importance of this issue and, and how strictly the, uh, well, the European Commission and the authorities have, have taken to ensuring that budgetary discipline and the rules are applied correctly. We have, of course, a particular issue at the moment uh, in, in Italy and without saying anything more about it, uh, it's distinctly possible we might hear about it in Luxembourg at some future date. I know taxation is always a big issue. Uh, it is generally left to member states, but there are cases where um, member states cannot um, you know, buy their tax uh, system uh, encroach on the, uh, you know, the various freedoms, freedom of movement of uh, capital and um, free movement of services, etc. We have the Apple case, but that doesn't come to us. That is with the general court. Uh, I think a hearing should take place very soon, and it's very possible it may it may come to our court. Uh, just last item: uh, fraud. Um, you know, there is a general principle of EU law that EU law cannot be relied on for the purpose of abuse or fraud, and I think this is an issue which. Um, you know, we've had various cases. I mentioned that case from Ireland, Cousin's case, which concerned a, a various uh, property transactions uh, which had to do with VAT. Um, and again, uh, we've had a, a case concerning uh, the social security system where posted workers are sent to another member state. They are given the equivalent of a passport. It's called an E-101 cert. I think it's an A-1 cert now. And again, the question that was posed to us, if a national court, while this cert is sacrosanct, you're not subject to the Belgian social security system if you come to Ireland with this cert. Uh, in fact, I was involved in the very first case concerning this. But this case concerned if a Belgian court finds that there has been fraud in the way this cert has been obtained or used, uh, does that still mean that that cert is valid unless withdrawn by the issuing member state. Uh, and we found that uh, the, uh, the, the, the uh, cert could be set, set aside in those circumstances that uh, EU law should not be used for the purposes of fraud. I was actually judge rapporteur in that case. If I'm right, you were appearing <laughs> before me, Kieran Toland. Yeah. And free movement and migration, uh, again, this is an issue which, because of the um, turbulence on our frontiers, uh, we have had constant um, uh, refugee crisis. Uh, again, it has featured the uh, Slovakia and uh, Hungary took a case against the decision on burden sharing and lost before our court. Um, we also have a, um, the Commission have initiated infringement proceedings against Hungary now uh, on this issue. Um, there, there is an also another case concerning Hungary, which uh, the concerns the um, the restrictions to, far, uh, to foreign grants to Hungarian civil or, civil organisations that have been trying to provide aid to refugees in Hungary, uh, and uh, you would have read about that in terms of the campaign against Mr. Soros in Hungary. Um, we had. Um, Going back to legal costs, two interesting cases, North East Pylon Pressure Campaign and uh, uh, Clone, which were two references from Ireland, and they concerned legal costs when uh, groups challenge uh, 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 the, the, uh, on environmental grounds 
uh, certain decisions made by the planning authorities. And uh, the issue is, uh, there's an Oros convention and there's a directive on this, but it's that for these groups, the legal cost shouldn't be prohibitively expensive. And uh, I think to summarize, we found that no, the legal cost shouldn't be prohibitively expensive. And even though the Oros convention does not apply, does not have direct effect, uh, that uh, this should apply. In conclusion, um, you know, as I've perhaps outlined, I hope that the court rules on you know diverse and uh, very live issues, political issues uh, that touch our everyday lives. And um, I think we, you know, we live in a, in a on a continent now, and I think we're more aware, even in Ireland, uh, than ever, just how important. Uh, problems that arise are solved at a European level. We saw that in the past with our economic crisis and we see it today with Brexit and uh, the support which Europe ha has provided and that element of solidarity. But apart from that, I, I do think that uh, we can make an extraordinary contribution. We, we're, we, uh, uh, I say that in terms of the law. I say it in the, the cooperation of the judiciary here. Uh, our lawyers before the court, uh, our presence in the court, uh, uh, I, I think we can play our part in ensuring um, that uh, the law is interpreted and applied in a manner which uh, fits with our perception of, of uh, uh, the legal world. And I think the same applies politically, and I think Ireland can, can play an important role, and I think probably uh, just as legally we have to be more assertive and uh, in terms of the, our legal system, I think it probably will be, if I may say this, politically I think Ireland will have to uh, play a much more active role uh, in the European Union's institutions and indeed in policy formation uh, uh, if we are to maintain uh, our presence and uh, re uh, retain our place at the heart of Europe. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you.